Welcome to worship, and it's good to be together uh, this morning, uh, especially if you're joining us online. Good morning as well. I want to just give you a couple of words of information and announcements as we get started for the day. Uh, tomorrow, it concludes our school uh, supply drive for the Jesse Norman School and Heritage Academy. And so if you will be mindful that any donations that you're bringing for that need to be brought today so we can get, or tomorrow, so we can get those out on Tuesday. Um, you can see Jenny Allen, if you have any questions or call the office, we'll help you out in that way. So again, school supply drive items need to be in here by tomorrow. Thanks. Also, our clothes closet that's uh, connected with the Mead House and everything has opened up for the first time last week. And uh, they are still opening every Tuesday to serve the community. And so your opportunity there to serve and help out is there. So Tuesdays from 11 to 1. Help out. We'd love to have you uh, if you have something to support there. Last week, I very briefly mentioned that I'm going to take a trip and a group of folks to Israel next February. And so if that is something you've ever wanted to do, to the Holy Land, things of that nature, and you would like some information, next Sunday, right after worship, we'll just kind of find a space over in room 108, and we'll have some conversation about that, just answer some questions, get some information, some ideas, things that you might have to know about that. I will say this, that if you've read the Gospels, going to the Holy Land is what they call the fifth Gospel. It's seeing everything you read about, and it's amazing. Uh, today, even as we talk about some of the things about the Sea of Galilee and the mounts and the things, it's just putting a visual on that. So if that's something you're interested in, being a part of a trip to the Holy Land next February 2022, um, next Sunday, August 1st, right after worship, we will meet in room 108 and would love to have you. So we'll talk some more about that. Just remember our lake services are happening. Thank you to those who this morning helped up there. Uh, we'll continue that through August, and so it should be a lot of fun. Um, and also want to let you know there's always opportunities as we're starting to get more and more back online, which is kind of ironic that we would say that phrase, right? Aren't we online already? Uh, but as we start getting ministries back to sort of full capacity, uh, there are more and more needs for volunteers and helping in different capacities. So be mindful of that. Find ways to serve and give in response to what God's done in your life. Let's prepare our hearts and our minds for worship today. We come here to be in God's presence, to respond to God's presence, and to worship. So let's prepare at this time.
14 through 21. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you're being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power of work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. from the Gospel of John. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. 
Philip answered, six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? And Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
So what truly makes a great dinner party? Is it the food? I mean, yeah, right? It's probably the decor, the ambiance, the space, right? That's part of it. The guest list, whoever shows up, matters. Is it the host? The host sort of set the tone and they make it possible. It's important, right? Or there's it's really something that's more tangible, something bigger, maybe, excuse me, not so tangible, something that's kind of beyond all of that. You see, these kind of moments that get imprinted upon our memory in life are things that, um, that's really what we remember. It's, it's, it's that moment, it's the sense, it's something beyond all those other pieces. Matter of fact, it's kind of like that day at the beach with your friends where the waves are perfect, the breeze is just right, the temperature is just there, it's sunny, everything's just right. Or, you know, it's kind of like fishing trip, you know, that you go on with your grandfather. And you catch all those right fish and all the conversation and everything that comes together and the snacks and you fry it up and you eat it. It's that moment, that experience, that memory. Maybe it's just that very simple Saturday night at your house. You made spaghetti. Maybe it's just playing games, watching movies, hanging out with your family. You see, it's memories that are the leftover morsels of these kind of banquets of our life, the heavenly banquets, the things that uh, bring us and really help us live fully. It's replaying these things and remembering them over and over. There's power in memory. That's why we talk about and invite people to remember things. This morning's gospel text, Jesus feeding on a hillside, was clearly memorable. It's recorded in all four Gospels, with a little different variations on each one. But there's something about it. It's significant to the memory of the people who interacted with Jesus. Jesus had withdrawn to a deserted place. He'd been overwhelmed. He'd been healing people. He was tired, and so he picked out this place he was kind of car camping, if you would. He was just kind of parked on the side of the road for a little bit, just trying to kind of get away from the fray and the busyness of everything going on. And so as he comes apart, he does the best he can, but the people follow him. The people that he's healed, the people that he's helped, the people that have come to him for teaching and instruction, he can't get away from them. They don't want him to get away from them. And he has compassion as we talked about last week. Jesus moved with compassion to cure the sick, to heal the wounded, to bind up those around him. And it's interesting because evidently Jesus' disciples have sort of kind of caught on to some of this, which is good. They've heard the message of compassion as well, and they themselves have started being compassionate. We hear from Andrew in this text. He starts kind of trying to figure out what are some possibilities, what's before him, what's around him that we could use to feed this big, huge flock of people. Now, I love Philip's response, don't you? Philip's like, there's no way, Jesus. That's impossible. It would take six months' wages for us to feed these people. Now, let's just put that in some hardcore numbers for a second, because that's probably what Philip would have been doing, right? He probably would have been calculating the actual cost of what is this backyard barbecue going to run me? What's it going to cost my bank account? Today, if you took sort of some of the average stats of making almost $12 an hour, $90 a day, that's over $12,000. $12,000 for that backyard barbecue. Now, that's just if you take the working class which is probably who's on the hillside here. But if you take an average in numbers for today and our average income, when you look at Augusta, Georgia, you're well over $25,000. And that's assuming you work five days a week. But I digress. Philip is concerned about a very expensive meal. He's concerned there's not enough provisions. He's concerned there's not enough resources. It's going to be impossible to feed all these people. And so they scramble about. They do what they can. And they find a young man. A young boy 
most likely a tot of some sort, who just has some food there with him. It's just his hot pockets out of his freezer that he's brought for the day. Can you imagine trying to feed people in that way? So really, in so many ways in this passage, the very first act of faith is these disciples being willing to look into the paltry resources they have and see what's possible. To give out of the limitedness that they have. I appreciate that. I respect that. Because for feeding of this size group, is pretty substantial. Now, I want to make some things really clear real fast. This story is known very often as the feeding of the 5,000. You need to be very, very clear. It's 5,000 men. So, assuming there's some wives in the group, some spouses are part of it, maybe not all of them are married, just take half of that. And then there's probably a few kids running around, at least one or two or five, right? You start doing those numbers, Philip, we're well over 15,000 people. Oh my goodness. Okay, the price tag just went up again. And so you see something's going on here in this. And so it's not just them looking into what is the little bit that they have to feed this huge mass and this huge response and this seemingly overwhelming mission before them. But they've got to draw upon more than just what's in front of them. And so the second real miracle is that as their own stomachs are grumbling and rumbling within them, there's a genuine concern the disciples bring forth. They're genuinely concerned about those around them. What a, what a transformation within them. What a, what a shift within them. Because they realize something that's going on here. They, they've, they've been listening to Jesus for a while. They've heard some of the messages. And they're starting to realize that this thing's working. And they get to be a part of it. And they get to participate in it. And they realize that it's not a DIY thing, a do-it-yourself thing. Discipleship's about doing it together. Doing it together as disciples. Doing it as Jesus did it. The ways in which Jesus brings them forth to say, look, it's about a togetherness. You see, that's the beauty of what it means to be church. And we're talking about this cornerstone living that we are part of, this thing we're called to be as the church. The mortar that holds it together is our community. That's this thing that holds us together, that we are knit together as the community of disciples. And you're not required to do it on your own. We do it together. Now, in this did approach to ministry, not DIY approach, but DID approach, we have to think about two things. You need to remember two things. One, we have to be willing to receive God's providence and provisions. We've got to be willing to receive God's provisions in the moment. What does God make available to us? What is there for us to latch on to, to be a part of? And we have to be willing to receive it. Think about Andrew's moment with that young boy. To be willing to receive this very small gift in light of all the bigness, this huge contrast... Is he willing to receive that as a gift from God, that the very thing, this small thing he has, will work? But there's a second piece of that, and it's a willingness within us to expect God's grace and God's truth to work. God's grace and God's gifts to work and to do more. You see, we talk about this in our Wesleyan circles, our Methodist circles, as provenient grace— and sanctifying grace. The provenient grace is the grace of those gifts of those five loaves and fish. Those loaves and fish are that grace that God's given and put there, and then we expect God's going to do something with it in that sanctifying work of our journey. To move into, to develop, and to grow those, out of those provisions and out of God's providence to then see and expect God's gifts to grow and to move forth. You see, then the crowd sits down 
Can you imagine that moment? They're all kind of looking around too. They're seeing the numbers. They're realizing how big this is. This is overwhelming. It's not possible. It's not going to work this way. There's no way, Jesus. But they sit down. They expect something is about to happen. And why? Because they remember Jesus did something before. Jesus did something. He healed their friend, provided for their neighbor, took care of their brother. They sat down. They were ready to receive. Ready to be a part of this. And you see, this is the difference in our mentalities of a human versus divine perspective. In our humanness, so often, we feel like we don't have enough. We look at that little small gift of bread and fish, and we say, it's not enough. There's no way. It's overwhelming. It's impossible. But the divine says, no, 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 no. The divine presence and perspective says there's plenty. Matter of fact, there's what left over? Leftovers. There's abundance. There's plenty. There's plenty of provisions for the journey, and not just for the journey of these on the hill, but for those beyond the hill. There's more than enough in that divine perspective. There's leftovers, and that's what the memory becomes. They remembered that memory way back, and there was a leftover to feed them in that moment that will feed them into the future provision for the journey. In 1996, Alexandra, or Alex Scott, was just shy of her first birthday, and she had been diagnosed with neuroblastoma, an aggressive childhood cancer. Through treatments and hospitalizations and others, friends began to help support her as a small little one, and she lived to four years of age. And when she was four, she created a lemonade stand. Pretty typical lemonade stand that we've seen kids, right? How many of us would not put a little table on the street corner or the sidewalk or our end of our driveway and try to sell lemonade? And so she and her family raised, through this effort of lemonade, over $2,000. Seems kind of small, like loaves and fishes. But that was donated to research and other things for childhood cancer. It was interesting how that caught fire as people began to hear about Alex's lemonade stands. And what began to happen is, over the course of the next few years, and just before her death at the age of eight in 2004, they had collected and started the Alex Lemonade Stand Foundation. And the whole mission was about battling childhood cancer. And they had raised over a million dollars. You see, that kind of perspective in the midst of what seems overwhelming is where we see God's grace at work, provision for the journey. A God who doesn't just provide what we need, but provides in abundance and far beyond. When we root ourselves in that, that's cornerstone living. More than enough. A cup that is overflowing. A God who lets you take home doggy bag leftovers of grace. That's what this is all about. You see, the leftovers, these are grace notes that we take with us. So, what do you do with leftovers? You know, we don't know this part of Scripture, and this is kind of the fun part that preachers get to take with a moment. In a passage, you kind of get to think about it a little bit more and explore and get creative. We don't know what happened next because they have these 12 baskets of food and we don't hear anything else. Matter of fact, they kind of just go on to the next story. But I would imagine that they started getting creative. They started wondering, hmm, what could be done with these baskets like the basket that was given to us? And just like the disciples wandered around the hillside there with people and giving out and the basket just kept being replenished and it never went empty, 
I wonder if they then wandered out into their neighborhoods and out into their communities and out into their families and out into their relationships and out into their world with these leftovers. And then out of that became an act of worship service, an action. And I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure they experienced some joy in the midst of that. You know, John Wesley, one of his favorite, one of my favorite quotes of his and statements, and it's on, it's in a frame of my office. It says that, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, to all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people that you can, as long as ever you can. You see, when we're rooted in that kind of deep and wide love that Paul talks about in Ephesians, when he says that I want you to know the love of God, the height, the width, the depth, the length, I'm reminded of that song we many of us learned growing up. There's a fountain flowing deep and wide, deep and wide, deep and wide. There's a fountain flowing deep and wide, and it's endless. It's this love of God that is endless, and then we swim in it, and it overwhelms us, and it captivates us. That is the image on this hillside that day. I want to give us a couple things to think about as we walk away from the hill today back into our communities and places that we go to live. I think in this passage we find great power from Jesus in his presence. There's power in presence. Jesus is with the people. Remember, he was trying to get away. He was trying to separate, spend some time, unwind, and and recharge, and that's important to do. But Jesus still has compassion, and he goes to be with the people. He doesn't separate himself. He doesn't isolate himself. He's with the people. Matter of fact, there's a beautiful, beautiful practice In Hebrew tradition, when people are going through grief or struggle or difficulty, and we definitely see it in the book of Job, it's called sitting Shiva. It's not really all that profound, but it's literally letting people know you're with them. You know, those of you who've made a commitment and a promise to this church or to any local church, In our United Methodist tradition, we say we will be faithful with our presence. It's that physical presence-ness. It's you. It's who you are with one another. And Jesus did that that day on that hill. And that is a provision for the journey. Who or how might you be the power of presence this day, this week, tomorrow, in the days ahead? in the way that Jesus was present with the people on the hill that day? How might you be part of that provision for the journey? How has that been true for you? Maybe that's where it needs to start. Maybe it's somewhere that you are regularly spending time in God's presence so that you can be a presence. A second thought to take with you. You know, Jesus offered the power of touch. One of the things I love when I serve communion, and we'll experience that next week when we're here together, is when I take that piece of bread and put it into someone's hand and touch that other person, that matters. That's significant to touch one another, appropriately, obviously. But to touch that physicalness of one another. We are made to be in community. Haven't we figured that out this past year? I'll never forget being back together for the first time and just seeing someone close up. There's power in touch. A number of years ago, I went out to Seattle with a group of clergy, and we were a part of exploring something called Dinner Church. And it's sort of a new missional effort that a lot of churches that are ecumenical in nature and different traditions, Lutheran, Methodist, Episcopal, Presbyterians, 
And what they're doing is they're literally creating tables of six or eight people and having dinner together and having church at the same time. And how many times have we served in a soup kitchen where we've gone and just served the food to the people that are there to come and then we kind of exit and disappear into the back, into the kitchen. And what we did when we were there in Seattle is we did that, but then we came and sat next to people we didn't know. And we got to touch them, shake their hands, hug them, say hello, get to know their stories. You see, there's something powerful about that moment because it actually feeds into this third idea that today we might could take away. Not just the power of presence, not just the power of touch, but maybe the power of relationship. And that's really what we're called to be as a church, right? And if we're going to talk about cornerstone living in this day and these days ahead for St. John and who we're going to be, friends, we have to be in relationship with one another. We have to know each other's stories and hear each other and listen as much as we talk. But then we also have to show up as others show up for us. You see, when we share that kind of space, there's trust built. And that's exactly what Jesus does over and over. The outstretched arms of our Savior being with us, touching us, and being in relationship and inviting us into that space. You see, this is the kingdom. This is soul food for us. This is provision for our journey. So... As you think about your own faith journey, as you think about what you will do this week and how you will live faithfully hearing these texts today and knowing the love of God and hearing these messages and singing these songs, what kind of food is in your diet? What kind of food is in your diet? Is it just the fast food things of life? Or is it time and presence and relationship? Is it just kind of eat and run and quick and hurry? Or is it being with? Is it sitting with the presence of God who loves you, who's here to be comfort and nourishment, to uplift, to sustain you? Are you willing to kind of notice those moments of grace that have been given to you? those morsels of leftovers from where God's grace has been present before and now feeds you into the days ahead. And maybe you'll wonder about them a little bit. Take them in. Assess them. Think about them. And then maybe wander about as the disciples did. Wander about into the world so that your joy and others' joy may be overflowing like that fountain overflowing with joy and love. You see, friends, the bread of life comes to nourish us, and to provide us provisions for the journey before, so that we in turn might be a provision for the world around us. So will you enjoy that provision? Will you be a part of it? And then will you share the leftovers, the continual leftovers of love that's been given to you. Let it be so now and always. Amen? Amen. As the people of God, let us stand together and affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed on page 881. We stand in reverence and we stand showing our unity together because we recognize that where the Spirit of the Lord is, among us, on a hillside, in a church pew, or wherever, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church. So let us affirm our faith this morning that's been passed down to us, and let us seek to live into it. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As you do so, I want to invite you to take a moment of reflection and we're going to pray together. And I want to invite us as a congregation to respond with thanksgiving of our lives and in prayer. The season of our life and our church is shifting as we look toward the fall and we address matters of gathering together in ministry in different ways. I want to invite you to pray. Pray for the leaders of this congregation as they make decisions in different ways for ministries and things of that nature. I want to keep you mindful of our prayer list that is before you. It's an act of serving and caring for one another as we pray for each other. If you'd like to be a part of that prayer group, contact me. And we'll get you plugged in. There's emails and communications. We'd love to pray together. A group meets on Monday mornings to pray over our prayer list, the needs of our community. I also remind you of the opportunity to serve with the school supplies. Do that in a way that you are able to respond in thanksgiving. I want us to pray together now, and I want to lead us. And I invite you to respond as you're able throughout the prayer. Let's pray together. Loving God, you are the creator and the sustainer of life. When you open your hand, you satisfy the hunger and the thirst of every living thing. And so we look to you when, wherever we are in need, trusting your love, trusting your abundant goodness. As you once fed the hungry crowd with five loaves and two small fish, we ask that you will again fill those who are empty this day. Pour out your spirit on all who are hungry and thirsty. We pray for those who are physically hungry, whose stomachs are empty. We think especially of people around the world and really those right here in our community who are facing critical food shortages, those who suffer the effects of malnutrition and starvation. God, those watching helplessly as a loved one dies. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we pray for those who are empty emotionally, who are lonely and long for companionship and love, who are caught in the grip of depression or overwhelmed with grief. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are spiritually empty, who are troubled, but don't know where to turn. God, who long for purpose and meaning, but don't know where to look. Who need you, but do not yet know it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we praise you for your abundant gifts in our lives. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us also. Fill us with your compassion and with your love so that we, we who willingly share some of our abundance with others who are in need, God, our hope is in you. And so we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who came so that all of humanity might know the abundant life that comes from you. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. I want to invite you as you're able. Let's stand together and sing our sending hymn, number 368, My Hope is Built.
take the leftovers of grace that have been given to you by someone else and to see them abundantly multiplied in your own life so that you, in turn, may see provision for your journey and the journey around you. May you go in the one who has created us, redeemed us, and sustained us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you now and always.